Hey guys, what's up? Welcome back to Beauty and Aram List, and we're going to talk about murder. Not sponsored by Duncan. I remember how much I hate Duncan. It's coffee, whatever. Um, so if you're new here, I'm Liz. I sit down and talk about true crime and sometimes there's art involved. Um, I try to talk about cases that are lesser known. I do talk about some popularized cases. Like I have two coming up that are incredibly popular. I'm not going to spoil it as of yet. You'll see when they come up because man, one has been on a TV show. And, like, yeah. And the other one is super well-known because of who it's about. But it's all during the Satanic Panic era. That's what we're doing for the month of March. So I hope you guys have enjoyed all of my uh, Satanic cases that I have, I have uh, been talking about. So, I bet you're wondering about the controversy of pixie sticks. Especially with Halloween. Well, well. So today we're going to be talking about the other Candyman. I've already talked about Dean Coral, but I have not talked about this man. He was also known as the man that killed Halloween. Now, you're probably wondering why I'm not waiting till Halloween to cover this case. And the reason is, is because this happened at like the notable beginning of the satanic panic era. Now, a lot of people say this started in the 60s, which yes, there was a lot of serial killers and killings happening in the 60s, but it really came out in the 70s. So we're going to be talking about Ronald Clark O'Brien today. Now, Mr. O'Brien, he was born on October 19th of 1944 in Houston, Texas. He is the man that killed Halloween. Yeah. So he was married. His uh, wife's name is Daneen. And he also had two children, Timothy and Elizabeth. Now, the... Okay. Okay. Ronald Clark O'Brien worked as an optician at the Texas State Optical in Sharpstown, Houston. Now... An optician basically is a practitioner who designs, fits, and dispenses lenses for people that need corrective vision, if you didn't know what an optician is. And basically, this is a case of a parent that kills their children or their child. He also worked as a deacon at the Second Baptist Church, and he sang in the choir, and he also ran a local school bus program. How sweet, right? Seems like a normal man. Well, well, on October 31st of 1974, he took his two children, Timothy and Elizabeth, trick-or-treating in Pasadena, in a neighborhood in Pasadena. Now, obviously, his neighbor, uh, well, it's not obvious, but... A lot of people, when you go trick-or-treating, you bring your neighbors with you. And Ronald, he invited their neighbor and their two children to accompany them. Now, after visiting a home where the occupant failed to answer the door, the children grew impatient and they ended up running to the next home while Ronald stayed behind. Eventually, he caught up to the group and he produced five, five 21-inch pixie sticks and this, this is when he would claim that he was given them by the occupant of the house that had not answered the door. Now, at the end of the evening, Ronald had given these pixie sticks out to the neighbor's two kids, one to Timothy and one to Elizabeth. And upon returning home, he would give the fifth one to a 10-year-old boy who he recognized from church. Now, before bed, his son Timothy ate some of the candy he collected. Any normal kid will do that on Halloween. And according to Ronald, Timothy chose the pixie stick. Now, Timothy had trouble getting the candy out of the straw, so this is when Ronald helped like break it up for him, try to loosen the powder. Now, after tasting the candy, this is when Timothy realized that it wasn't, it wasn't sweet, it was actually bitter. 
And then this is when Ronald gave him some Kool-Aid to wash away the taste. Now almost immediately, Timothy realized that his stomach started hurting. He ran to the bathroom and he started convulsing. Now, Ronald would later claim that Timothy, while he was vomiting, um, he went limp in his arms. Timothy, unfortunately, would die en route to the hospital less than an hour after consuming the candy in the pixie stick. Now, because of his death and how it was linked to candy, and Halloween candy in particular, this raised fear in the community. There was a numerous amount of family, uh, families and parents in Deer Park and the surrounding areas that turned in their candy that their children got while trick-or-treating. And they turned it into the police because they were feared... They feared that it was laced with poison and they didn't want their kids to die like Timothy had. Now, police didn't suspect Ron of doing anything wrong until the autopsy revealed that the pixie stick he consumed was laced with a fatal dose of potassium cyanide. Isn't that so sweet? Now, potassium cyanide is quite a... It's not really common to have unless you really want to do something to somebody, you know, unless you really want to poison them. So about four out of the five pixie sticks Ronald claimed to receive were recovered by authorities uh, from the other kids that he gave them to. And none of them consumed the what was inside. So the parents of the fifth child were extremely hysterical because they couldn't locate the pixie stick. Um, after they were notified by the police. Now the parents rushed upstairs to find their son asleep and he was holding the pixie stick. The boy had been unable to open the staples of the, like the wrapper of the pixie stick. So that's why he never consumed it. So after all five pixie sticks were opened, um, with like the top two inches of the pixie stick were filled with cyanide and they were resealed with a staple. Now, according to a pathologist who tested these, the candy that was consumed by Timothy contained enough cyanide to kill two adults, while the other four candies contained enough to kill three to four adults. So he really, want, he really wanted to kill these kids. So Ronald initially had told police that he couldn't remember which house he got the sticks from. And this is when the police began to start being suspicious of him and his, like, So they became, they became suspicious of him and his neighbor um, had only taken their children to the homes on two streets because it was raining. So a lot of the suspicion that ar like arose due to this is because none of the homes that they visited had pixie sticks. So where the fuck did he get them? That's what pe police were, like, really confused about. So after they walked the neighborhood um, with him three times, this is when he led them to a house where nobody answered the door. Now, Ronald claimed that he went back there before catching up with the group. And he said the owner of the home did not turn on the lights but cracked the door open and gave him five pixie sticks. Really odd, right? Now, uh, he claimed to have only seen the man's arm and described it as hairy. Now, the home was owned by a man named Courtney Melvin. Courtney Melvin is an air traffic controller at the William P. Hobby Airport. He didn't get home until 11 p.m. that night, so it wasn't him. They ruled him out as a suspect because of over 200 people confirmed he was at work that night, so it couldn't have been him. Now, police would continue investigating until they discovered that Ronald wasn't the good guy. He had over $100,000 worth of debt and he had a history of not being able to hold his job. In the 10 years preceding this crime, he had 21 different jobs. Now at the time of his arrest, he was suspected in theft at his job at the Texas State Optical and he was almost fired. So his car was about to be repossessed. He defaulted on several bank loans and the family home had been foreclosed on. This is also when they discovered that he had taken out life insurance policies on his children in the months preceding Timothy's death. 
In January of 1974, he had taken about taken out $10,000. Now the equivalent of this in 2020 is about $52,000. And he had taken these out on both of his children. One month before Timothy's death, he had taken out an additional $20,000 on each and on each child. And this was like the agency he went through kind of like objected it, but he still did it anyway. So in the days preceding Timothy's death, Ronald had taken out yet another $20,000 policy on each child. So if you think about that, that's that totals about 60,000 per kid. Now, his wife, Danine, um, said that she didn't know anything about the insurance policies on her kids, and police learned that the morning of Timothy's death as well that Ronald had called the insurance company to inquire about collecting the policies that had taken out on his son. After learning that Timothy had, well, and it's a little odd that he would call, like, right after his son died. Don't you think you would be mourning with your family? Well, um, they also learned that Ronald visited a chemical supply store in Houston to buy cyanide shortly before Halloween in 1974. He left without uh, purchasing anything after, like, learning that the smallest amount available to purchase was five pounds. Police began to suspect him in lacing the candies with poison in an effort to kill his children in order to collect his life insurance policies. Uh, they believe he then gave the other children poison candy in an effort to cover up his crime to make it look like it wasn't him that did it. It was somebody that gave out candy. So after they discovered all of this, they were never able to really discover where or like when or where he bought the poison. He was arrested for his son's murder on November 5th of 1974, and he was indicted on one count of capital murder. Um, he entered a plea of not guilty, and his trial began on the 5th of May of 1975. Well, well, this case would come to a close on June 3rd of 1975, where it took a jury only 46 minutes to find him guilty of capital murder and four counts of attempted murder of the other kids that he gave 66 to. The jury then took about 71 minutes to sentence him to death by electrocution. Now, shortly after he was convicted, his wife, Deneen, filed for a divorce, and she later remarried, and her new husband adopted her daughter, Elizabeth, as his own. So, he would spend a little bit of time in prison before he would be executed. Um, now, he, his first execution date was August 8th of 1980, and his attorney, or, like, petition for a stay of execution. Then it was postponed to May 25th of 1982. This was also postponed again. His third one was scheduled for October 31st of 1982. This was the eighth anniversary of the death of his son. Um, and he and like the crime, but yet again, it was delayed and it had been the first time that Texas had executed a inmate by lethal injection. So his he was originally sentenced to, exit, um, to electrocution, but Texas switched over to lethal injection. So, and this was due to the Supreme Court. Now, his fourth date was set as March 31st of 1984. His lawyer sought for a fourth stay of execution on the basis that lethal injection is cruel and unusual punishment. Now, the federal judge rejected this request, and on March 31st of 1984, shortly after midnight, he was executed by lethal injection at the Huntsville unit. Now, his final statement that he said, he maintained his innocence and stated that he felt that the death penalty was wrong. He also added that, I forgive all, and I do mean all, those who have been involved in my death. God bless you all, and may God's bl best blessings be always yours. There was a crowd of 300 people gathered outside the prison cheering while some yelled trick or treat and others showered the anti-death penalty demonstrators with candy when he was executed. He is buried at Forest Park East Cemetery in Webster, Texas, and his son Timothy is buried elsewhere at Forest Park Lawndale Cemetery in Houston. Now that, my friends, is the lovely case of the man that killed Halloween.
I know it's such a such a fun case, right? That sucks. Why why kill Halloween? Didn't do anything to you. Um, but yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed and I'll see you guys in another video. Bye guys.